My name is Muyi Aina and I am the Chief Executive at the Solina Center for International Development and Research, SIDA. I'm also the Program Director, uh, by the way, of the NRISP program. Strengthen the capacity of the states, the six MOU states, um, to manage and deliver their routine immunization programs. There was a shortage in personnel. There were always gaps in terms of just how many staff the government had in across the states. But even for those that were there, there were several capacity gaps, you know, ranging from just an awareness and knowledge to skill and even to motivation. We went through a consultative process to design a fairly robust capacity program, which has evolved over time, of course, as we learned more. And the idea was to do a number of things. One was to identify the key officers that were critical in the pathway to achieving success in the program. So we weren't going to be able to target everybody that worked in the state or even in immunization at the state. Um, the second thing, was to develop interventions that were targeted towards adult learning. The most important thing for building the capacity is understanding that you needed to be there and to be embedded with the government teams, um, to sit with them um, and execute with them. As you may be aware of adults don't learn much in classrooms. You can learn a little bit, but a lot of what adults learn is self-learning or hands-on mentoring and capacity building. So we developed interventions around that, which was we taught them things, we gave them resources to read, we paired them with our staff who had some of the skills that we wanted to transfer, and they showed them how to do it. And we went through a process of you show them how to do it, you watch them do it, support them, then you watch them do it by themselves. Um, and when they got to that point, we went ahead to develop a backstop for them in the organization. One was to identify the key officers that were critical in the pathway to achieving success in the program. So we weren't going to be able to target everybody that worked in the state or even in immunization at the state. Um, the second thing was to develop interventions that were targeted towards adult learning techniques. So as you may be aware of adults don't learn much in classrooms. You can learn a little bit, but a lot of what adults learn is self-learning or hands-on mentoring and capacity building. So we developed interventions around that, which was we taught them things, we gave them resources to read, we paired them with our staff who had some of the skills that we wanted to transfer, and they showed them how to do it. And we went through a process of you show them how to do it, you watch them do it, support them, then you watch them do it by themselves. Um, and when they got to that point, we went ahead to develop a backstop for them in the organization. So the learning um, occurs even within the project um, through our knowledge management and learning agenda where we're able to put states together to um, share lessons um, uh, using a peer-to-peer -peer format and improve um, results both ways. That was one of the real innovative things that we actually did. We developed a proprietary approach, which is now fairly popularly adopted to measuring the capacity of personnel within government. And it was just more in an applied way to say, look, if somebody is not doing a great job, what, what stage are they at? Is it that this person isn't doing their task at all? Or are they doing their task with a lot of assistance from partners or from somebody else? Or are they doing it independently when they are nudged or when they are asked to do it? And then there's a last stage which is are they doing it by themselves with no help from anybody? They know they should do it and they just get it done. And then there's of course do they have a backstop when they have met that, that bar. 
So we did that because we found practically that that was the incremental set of steps. And interventions and the reasons were fairly diff different depending on what stage you were. If people weren't doing their, their, a task at all, many a times it was because they actually didn't know that it needed to be done or they didn't know how to do it. If they were doing it with a lot of help from partners, it's more a, an ability issue. So they didn't quite know what to do, so they would rely on partners to get a lot of help. If they were doing it with a nudge, it was more a motivation issue. So they know what to do and they can do it, but they won't do it unless somebody nudges them or compels them to do it. time we went in, there were a lot of issues with funds that should get to the front line getting there. Sometimes it was delays and timelines, sometimes it was leakages along the way um, because most of the interactions were, you know, hand-to-hand -hand interpersonal transactions, physical cash transactions. Um, and one of the things that we did was to say, okay, one of the ways to guarantee or to increase the likelihood that the funds will get to the front line, the person who would actually use it, and so that the activity can actually be completed. Talking about services to the facility, talking about outreaches, you just pay for transportation for outreaches, pay for basic supplies for that, was to transfer the money directly to the front line health worker. So some, you know, some early work around direct uh, money transfers to the people. So we made all of the facilities open accounts that were signatories were the in charge officers and we basically computed every month with the state primary health care finance teams and accountants of course what was due them as part of the MOU activities and transferred it to them directly and they retired it retired it in that they provided evidence that the activity was actually implemented. If you went to do an outreach, you showed some documentation with people signing. If you provided other services, you provided some document. And then we built in verification processes. So you know in Kaduna State Government, we have our financial instruction, which we use in our activities, our daily activities in our MDAs. So before, of course, financial, uh, we normally do cash book manually. We have a big cash book which we record all our transactions monthly and we reconcile. Then when we started also, uh, we are taking our schedules to the commercial banking for onward payment to the various facilities, which were having a lot of challenge because when we sent schedules of more than, uh, there was, at the time there was a CBM policy of not uh, this was more than 20 uh, persons per day. Imagine if we now send uh, about over 200 facilities, it will take one, one, one week for them to um, uh, make that payment. And sometimes uh, all those uh, failed payments cannot be easily traced. Before the financial management design uh, capacity building was made, we have a problem in identifying some challenges in the financial management retirements. More especially, how to track our funds or how to track how which LG and which health facilities have made their retirement or not. But with this training, financial management capacity building training, we can be able to track our funds. So and at every month, we are tracking all our expenditure from the day one to the end of the month. Um, and one of the things that we did was to say, okay, one of the ways to guarantee or to increase the likelihood that the funds will get to the front line, the person who would actually use it, and so that the activity can actually be completed. Talking about services to the facility, talking about outreaches, you just pay for transportation for outreaches, pay for basic supplies for that, was to transfer the money directly to the frontline health worker. So some, you know, some early work around direct uh, money transfers to the people. So we made all of the facilities open accounts that were 
signatories were the in charge officers and we basically computed every month with the state primary health care finance teams and accountants of course what was due them as part of the MOU activities and transferred it to them directly and they retired it retired it in that they provided evidence that the activity was actually implemented if you went to do an outreach you showed some documentation with people signing if you provided other services you provided some document and then we built in verification processes And when before the uh, uh, the uh, MOU started, the funding is just through local government, and most of the facilities were not benefiting, and so the facilities have never even uh, uh, got fund for this purpose. At the same time, uh, most of the, more, almost all the facilities doesn't have a bank account, but with this we develop uh, to make sure all functional health facilities must have bank account and. Uh, they're all getting their uh, money through direct fund transfer without any third party. Before there was no validation because we make payments, you understand, we make payments to individual and then we make retirement. But with this RI, because we are giving money to facilities, so to ensure that yes, these funds was paid, was spent accordingly, so there has to be validation and we should make calls to the settlement that they went for the outreach we make calls there and then we ask whether the ri providers went to the facility for for out for immunization once the village head or the caregiver answer yes then we now know that yes they went to that settlement if they say no that's when they do not go so we can't we can't pay the money with the application of uh, corporate i banking with the encouragement of sina we now uh, taking up uh, corporate eye banking, which uh, most of the transactions we are doing it at our table, we are already taking our mandate to the banks. We do it in our office, and just within an hour, transaction of whatever magnitude would be done without any uh, stress. So, and then after this, then we are going to present it to the house. That is the SERI committee. We are going to present it to the house to all those who are concerned to know our transparency and accountability. When you go to the cloud, you will see our retirement because we have computerized all of our retirement into the system. With this introduction of this RI, we have so many partners, at least now. Because of this, our financial manager that has been strengthening. We have partners now that, that are partnering with us and they are giving us their funds and they know that yes, we can, we can take care of their funds very well. One of the things that is more proximal that you could link with the financial management intervention was just the fact that funds actually got to the front line. You could measure that. Um, there's capacity gaps everywhere. So once you build somebody's capacity and they're able to actually do a great job, then everybody wants to hire them. Most notably, um, even implementing partners of the government um, yeah, so that was, and it's difficult, you know, that those are more lucrative, they pay better salaries. You can't really penalize somebody to stay in a job that they don't want to stay because they are, they are better skilled, right? I think it's a number of things. One, we, there was just a buying of the government itself, which is that you, can, you can't wake somebody who's pretending to be asleep, right? That's a saying that is often said. So they wanted their capacity built. So there was signaling at the top. And when the signaling wasn't as strong, we saw that it affected the, the rate of success of the capacity building. But when we had strong signaling from the top, meaning even from the governor level, but sometimes even just from the, 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 the chief executive of the state primary health care agency or board, as it might be, then the staff were very enthusiastic, they took it up, that's one. Two was the applied nature of the capacity building itself, where people were learning on the job. People didn't have to take time off work, you know, and we adopted adult learning techniques. That really, really helped. So there was a lot of mentoring, hands-on, there was practicalization, there was a lot of feedback. 
um, you know, we build relationships with each of these people. Um, so I think that that really helps. The board has uh, challenges with uh, managing its uh, human resources, uh, especially the core uh, staff um, that deliver health services uh, in various um, facilities. Uh, remember, Kano has um, over 1,200 facilities uh, scattered, uh, distributed, across 44 local government areas and these staff um, are around um, permanent staff alone are around 9,000 over 9,000 uh, temporary staff of almost the same strength. Getting to know where they are, what they do uh, is always uh, difficult uh, which makes um, delivering health care uh, in especially the remotest areas difficult. Uh, therefore, we need to uh, see how we um, distribute our staff, how we manage our staff more efficiently. Before the HRH unit, uh, staff are managed um, by the admin department without a designated officer handling uh, human resources, especially around their distribution, their training, uh, etc. Sometimes you struggle to, to even know who, which staff you have, what they possess as qualification. Uh, the um, establishment of the Human Resource for Health uh, was a painstaking process. Uh, we envisage that uh, for us to um, optimize our human resources for health, uh, we need to um, move away from the traditional method of uh, government system of filing, of, of keeping, um, of moving paper trail. Uh, we need to, we need to design an IT um, system and information technology system. Uh, so CEDA um, supported us from redesign uh, to um, all the technical conversation uh, to reviewing what we've done and all, also ensuring that we piloted and rolled out the Human Resource for Health. So uh, it's an end-to-end -end support um, right from the conception up to the implementation of it. Um, when we started, uh, people began to, to view it negatively. Um, when the idea came that we need to profile all our staff, uh, ensure that we capture their biometrics because what we've done was capture every employee of the State Primary Health Care Management Board on our database uh, so that we can now pin uh, fees to the name. Uh, so people began to view it negatively as if we want to sack some of them. Uh, therefore, we met some little resistance from staff, very little of it. Uh, two, it took us quite a while to figure out the system we need. Uh, it had to go uh, a series of design, redesign, you know, back and forth, and which took time. Uh, uh, we also, the infrastructure, initially the board never had a server that it can host. Uh, therefore, we need to um, uh, procure uh, all the needed uh, backbone materials that we need to have the the system uh, running. A lot of our staff are not 
IT compliance, some lack minimal knowledge of how uh, information technology functions. So uh, you need to take them through and through um, the whole system. Uh, and also the network, since we are doing this real time online, um, uh, in some places you find internet very challenging. Uh, we were able to overcome some of these challenges. Uh, we um, um, roll out uh, this, um, especially the management at the lower level uh, recently, and we've seen a positive uptake of this system. It's too early to, to begin to attribute what this had resulted into. Um, however, what is obvious is that we are now able to visualize where our staff are, what they do, uh, see areas of um, gap, um, how we're going to fill it. And uh, we've used this system in some of our pilot facilities. Um, there are a few facilities that we want to ensure that all the services needed, primary services, primary healthcare services needed in those uh, facilities are provided. So we use that system to see where our human resource for health gaps are, and we are able to also source from uh, some other places where we saw an excess because we use the system to now do a workload analysis and see uh, where redundancies are and move people to where we feel uh, they can optimally be used. Coordination is the bedrock of um, program management um, and ultimately that is how you identify all of the key inputs that you need to make the program work. In even executing anything without a work plan we wouldn't be able to execute any program. Um, because the MOU principles um, negate that, you would need to definitely have a work plan that is approved um, that um, is also linked with a monitoring and evaluation framework um, and that can measure to, to what extent we perform. So without those platforms um, and those structures that help to ensure coordination and planning, um, we wouldn't really have any intervention executed. Um, and so I think that that is a key contributor to the overall success of the project. Um, I also think that um, without the working groups and the coordinating body, um, you wouldn't be able to um, effectively course correct on programs. Um, the states through the working groups are able to continually review what is working and what is not working well um, and tap into the experience um, and skills of the different partners that are providing TA. So, you know, before the, the MOU, uh, there were a lot of parallel uh, programs and partners, they are doing their own programs, said they are doing their own uh, programs. So there was no uh, coordination and that actually what led to the establishment of the EOC and also the MOU. So uh, uh, part of the working groups that were established was the uh, training working group, uh, started with the mandate of uh, coordinating all the capacity and training uh, activities in the state. So there aren't really any structures in place for routine immunization specifically. Um, it was typically the one-man state immunization officer who, you know, took decisions um, and executed the different pieces of work. Um, but with the MOUs, um, a number of things um, came into play. Um, but before I describe that, also looking at the work planning. So it used to be that the work plans were individualized. So all of the different partners, multinationals or local partners, 
implementing routine immunization we're all implementing independently um, and there wasn't really any harmony or coordination in who was doing what um, there also weren't budgets um, to define how much the immunization program needed every year um, and as such release was very very poor because for you to be able to ask for money you need to know how much um, that you're asking for you know The first thing that we did was establish the working groups, um, define specific terms of reference for the working groups that included the membership um, of each working group, making sure that they were all led by government um, officials, um, and that included the RI operational working group and the sub, sub um, thematic area working groups. These technical working groups are about seven or eight, kind of called. Uh, we have uh, the PSC Technical Working Group itself, which has been chaired by the executive chairman of the agency that meets once in a month. We also have other working groups like the Governance and Finance Working Group that meets once in a month. We have the Logistics Working Group that handles of the, all the logistics of the, of the agency. Uh, also we have the MI Working Group, Supporters of Vision Working Group. We have the HRH and Capacity Building Working Group. We have the social mobilization and community engagement working group uh, and we also have the service delivery and diagnostics working group. And the MOU was actually extended to Bochy State. The RI MOU in Bochy State was signed in 2014. For Bochy, there was an additional uh, partner which was USAID which was already uh, in Bochy. So uh, the RI MOU was signed uh, actually to strengthen uh, routine humanization, to have structures that will be able to strengthen the system. The MOU was um, initially signed for four years, 2014 to 2018, and um, the, uh, with a lot of uh, things to it, including the different funding stream that would be given by BADO's partners. Through our work, we've been able to, first of all, establish or strengthen the state task force on immunization, which is kind of like the overarching body um, that does coordination and oversight. So that platform serves as a, a seat of accountability that challenges the agency to be sure um, that things are going on in accordance with the agreement that was signed. Um, next to that are the technical working groups that were established. Um, these coordination fora in, in conjunction with the SDFI um, kind of do the day-to-day -day program um, implementation while the SDFI is kind of providing oversight. And every year there is an RI work plan that is fully costed um, within the budget cap of um, of a needs analysis that had been done to say how much it would cost. We pull everyone together through the working groups um, to include their activities in the work plan um, across all themes, across all partners, um, and that ultimately helps to keep track of what has been done versus not. Um, and then we also instituted quarterly reviews of the annual work plan um, to make it um, a lot more flexible such that at the beginning of the quarter you could review the past quarter and reprioritize activities for the next quarter. Um, and that's also institutionalized. Ultimately, because of that structured way of carrying out the program, the program is a lot more resilient. Um, and there are standing routines and, um, and, and um, clear guidelines for getting things done. Um, and there's also the involvement of the executives, there's the involvement of the deputy governor. So we're able to ensure continued political will, continued leadership and oversight, um, and accountability where um, people fail. We have a well-oiled engine in terms of program management in these states that is not, is not as obtainable um, in other non-MOU states who have not benefited from Solina's and NRSB support.